Welcome to this series of lectures. So they're going to be um, uh, every Wednesday afternoon for the next four weeks. Um, the way it's going to work is I'll, I mean, it's a fairly reasonably relaxed timetable, but I'll, I'll lecture for about an hour, two till three, then we'll have a half hour coffee break, and then I'll do half three till half four. There's plenty of time at the end for, for questions and such like that. I'm going to do two lectures in the afternoon round about that kind of, um, that kind of timing. Uh, this is being webcast and recorded, so uh, there's people hopefully watching this online, which is why I want to start on time. What I'll do is I'll do the sort of slightly um, less interesting, more formal talk first, quickly, just to let people, if people are having trouble getting on, online, I will, um, I'll, I'll do this lecture first. For those of you um, watching online, uh, you should see... Um, where you're logged in, under the video, there should be a number of tabs, uh, defaults to notes, but there's a discussion tab. And if you, type, if, you, if you click on the discussion tab and you type in a message, a comment, then, um, then I'll be able to see it here. There is a delay between the live and the stream to up to between 30, 45 seconds. So uh, apologies if I don't get back immediately. But please, if you're online and you want to ask a question, just, um, just click on that discussion tab and, and type in the um, type in your question anyone in the audience please, it's fairly relaxed please ask a question during the lecture if you want just just shout it out and I'll, I'll answer it so that's um, so we're going to do. I just wanted to give a very brief um, overview of uh, where this training is coming from um, so th this training is being given as, as part of um, the uh, Archer training courses, and I'll explain a bit about what that is in the next few slides. But it's also being pre uh, presented um, live here to informatics students. So Bob Fisher, who's just who entered the room, has organised this. So we thought it was a good, um, a good way of, of, of serving two communities, having people locally who could hear the lectures live, but people anywhere across the UK or across the world could could follow them, and we'll be recording these, and all the videos will be available on the web um, subsequently. Um, I'll just go through all the material is under normal Creative Commons, so you're, you're welcome to reuse it as long as we attribute it. Um, so the, how are we able to give these courses? Well, these courses are given as part of the Archer service. Archer is the UK national supercomputer, which is actually managed by EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, but it's housed, operated, and supported by EPCC, which is where I'm from, and I'll explain what we do a bit later. And the hardware is supplied by Cray. It's a Cray computer. But as part of that service, we don't just host the hardware. We run, um, we do a lot of training. Um, and as I'm head of the, of, the, of the training part of the computational science and engineering support team. So uh, we give 72 trainings, uh, days training. A lot of it face-to-face, -face, but some of it online as well. It's all free training. This is Archer. This is the, uh, it's, it's housed at something called the Advanced Computing Facility, which is down at the Bush Estate. Um, all right, 10 kilometers south of Edinburgh. I'll come back to this machine um, later on. I'll use it as a test example. Uh, and we'll be doing any, any, those of you who want to do the practical exercises, you're able to do it on this machine as well. So I've mentioned EPC. What is EPCC? Well, we consider ourselves to be the UK National Supercomputer Center. Um, um, the way it works in the UK, there isn't actually a nominated national supercomputer centre, but we've been involved in running the last three national computer services for well over a decade. We were founded in 1990, originally with the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre, but formerly we're now with just EPCC. We're part of, we're an institute at the University of Edinburgh, we're largely self-funding with about 70 staff. And we've been running national parallel systems on and off since, since for over 20 years. The very first national parallel supercomputer, coincidentally, was also a Cray, um, was installed in 1994. And we do a large range of projects. Just to note here, I mean, you, you, people in the audience won't be particularly interested, but we run a postgraduate master's course in HPC. Uh, there's the URL there. And we also run some accredited online courses as part of um, uh, the university's data science technology innovation program. So they're fee paying. Um, again, uh, there are key Archer resources, but this, is, this isn't really, a, uh, although we're going to run some of the examples on Archer, this isn't a course about Archer. So hopefully the way I've presented the exercises, they're shrink-wrapped enough that you don't need to, const you don't need to um, consult the documentation. But th there is quite a lot of doc documentation online. Who am I? Well, my name's David Henty. I said I work at EPCC. I'm in charge of training. I'm in, I'm in charge of the MSC program. We're also Price Advanced Training Centre. And I'm charge of the Archer training program. Um, Praise is a big European collaborative project. I do some c commercial training. And I, I do do some HPC research, mainly in parallel programming models and performance and such like. 
Uh, other resources, please fill in the feedback form. Um, we do like to get uh, feedback, so um, we'll, we'll be uh, emailing you and bugging you to fill in the feedback form. Um, it is completely anonymous, so please give your feedback. If you want to follow up anything about Archer, then um, uh, anything about the training, anything about the service at all, then there's a unified help desk, support at archer.ac.uk. You can contact that and we'll try and get back to you. Again, I mentioned we, we run a couple of MSc programs in HPC and high performance computing and in HPC with data science um, for over 15 years. And again, that's the URL. I need some of our students. Uh, these are also the online accredited courses. So just these, these, these are fee paying, uh, but they run from January to June each year. The each is about 20 credits. So that's actually their, 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 their sort of double courses. In an MSc context, a normal talk course would be 10 credits. We run a course in practical introduction to high performance computing and practical introduction to data science. Um, so if you're interested in, in doing an accredited course, you could sign up for them. But they do, they do cost money. This isn't relevant. Um, those of you, well, during the course, you can get guest accounts. Um, so you should have seen in the email that Claire would have sent you how to apply for an account on Archer. You're welcome to apply for one. Um, those accounts will be live for the next, at least the next month or so. This, this slide is relevant for our short courses, which only run for a couple of days um, where, when there's sort of more constraints. Um, but um, with that. So, um, so your accounts, if you apply for an account on Arch, you'll get one which will last for a month or so. So you will have to take off any work after that, but for a month or so, it'll all be okay. Um, if you want to get onto access to Archer longer term, then if you're interested for a, a research project or such like, you can look at the standard access me mechanism. They're all fairly you know, quite heavyweight applications for proposals and, and requests for time. The way it works, if you want to do a project which required a lot of um, supercomputer, you, would, you might submit a research proposal saying, I would like, you know, I want, I want one postdoc for two years and I need a million hours of Archer and you could apply for them. But actually, probably more interesting for you guys is we have an online thing called the Archer Driving Test, and um, it's a bunch of questions, 20 multiple choice questions, which basically they're just to ensure that you've read the documentation. And if you complete that driving test and pass it, you get an account which lasts for 12 months and gives you about 80,000 core hours of time, which is quite a small percentage of Archer, but it's quite a lot. It's like running on your laptop for three years or something. So that's a way, if you wanted to do something a bit more substantial, um, then you could, you could apply for that. And there are, there are funding calls for larger if you want to do longer projects, but that's not particularly relevant. Okay, so that was just the, the brief sort of word from our sponsors. Um, I wanted to just briefly, especially for those online, go through where the materials are going to be. So the main page for Archer, well, for this course, is always the, um, the training page, archac uh, UK slash training. Uh, this is the course we're running just now, obviously. Uh, this is the live feed. But I've put up the po a page for the course material. So if you go to the course material page, which is linked in from there, you'll see that there is... Um, uh, the, the lectures for this day, uh, we will put the video up afterwards. Uh, the exercises I'll come back to later. And, um, yeah, the videos will probably go up on YouTube. And there is, um, is, there is a um, sort of collaborative um, chat space called Hackpad. If you want to go there, you don't have to sign in, um, where you can just um, uh, you can post comments. So that might be useful. But, but, but just registering for this, you, you, you're able to, to, to leave comments and such like. And that might be a useful way of communicating. So the way it's going to work is I'll give, I'll give lectures today and there'll be some exercises. Uh, at the start of next week, I'll, I'll, um, I'll go over solutions to the exercises and talk about them. But in the meantime, if you have any questions and such like, uh, we'd hope that we could you know, collaborate and interact with people uh, via this Hackpad link that's linked in there. So hopefully that's everything, all the mechanics set up. So, I'll, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a kind of motivational talk, um, which I originally um, I originally wrote for the um, British Science Festival, which was held in Aberdeen a few years ago. So it, it's slightly light-hearted talk, but um, there are there, it's trying to explain some of the fundamental concepts. So I'll go through this and try and talk around it. And what I'm trying to do here is to try and um, try and cover a few key concepts. The main, the main concepts are trying to, to, try to convey where the driver comes from to build very large supercomputers. 
a little bit about the history and really just to kind of make the link between um, parallelism, parallel computing and, and, and high performance computing, how they come together. So this is really quite a, sort of a bit of a fun talk and I'll go into a bit more technical details later, but hopefully it does have some content. So uh, we've talked about what EPCC is. Um, we're currently down, if you know Edinburgh, at the, J at the King's Buildings campus, but we are moving into town um, from 2018 and we'll be actually co-located with informatics. So, you know, what are computers used for? Well, of course, now computers are ubiquitous. When I first started doing computing, they weren't ubiquitous at all back in the, in the mid-80s. Um, so they're used for playing games and for playing games and social media, watching videos, surfing the internet, email. Heaven forbid they could be used for some kind of, some kind of actual useful work. But what I'm going to try and explain in this talk is where the driver for supercomputing comes in, very large, powerful computers, comes uh, not from that kind of desktop applications, but from using computers for scientific discovery. So, um, you know, what I'm going to explain next is that, that computing, and particularly large-scale computing, is completely in, um, intrinsic to the modern scientific process, and, and also in, in large-scale industry as well. So it's not just academia, but all scientific and technical um, um, uh, discoveries now tend to have computing at their heart. So I've got a picture there of Einstein, which is maybe slightly ironic because Einstein would nev never have used a computer. But I'm going to come to an example here. So here's a picture. Um, the, the field which drives um, supercomputing is, is called computational science. Not computer science, which is the scientific study of computers, but computational science, which is using computers to solve scientific problems. And so how, what it, what's since the sort of renaissance, since the time of Newton and such like, the way that things worked is you came up with a theory, and here's a picture of Peter Higgs, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, his theory of the Higgs boson. You came up with a theory, you put it on a blackboard, and then from that theory, you made predictions and you tested them in an experiment. So this is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider, which was built uh, in CERN, and it was there, this you know, multi-billion euro project, to discover and confirm the existence of the Higgs boson, this particle that was predicted by Peter Higgs back in the, in the, in the mid-60s. And so that, the, loop, the loop there was you had a theory, you, you, you studied the theory, you used mathematics to make predictions, you then tested the predictions, and if they were correct, you were happy. If they were incorrect, you loop back and refine your theory. Okay? Now, that's typically not really the way things work now, what happens in the loop is you have computer simulation. So what happens now is you have a theory, and to make a prediction requires computer simulation. And that's actually a picture of a simulated event at the Large Hadron, uh, an event at the Large Hadron Collider producing a Higgs boson, but it was created decades before Higgs, the Higgs boson was ever discovered. And so the loop now in, in almost all science and um, you know, large technical engineering projects is you have some theory but to make the predictions, which you can test experimentally, you have to run a computer simulation. You, could, you run a computer simulation, do the experiment, and then you go back. So the loop has this step of computer simulation. And so computers and computer simulation are completely intrinsic to the modern scientific um, process. Now, you might ask why. Okay? So why are we just more stupid than we used to be? And Einstein didn't need a computer. Peter Higgs didn't have a computer. Well, it, it turns out that there are a large number of things you want to do which you, you simply can't actually even possibly even do the experiment. So, for example, well, the equations might be too complicated. It's very easy to write down complicated equations. It's much harder to solve them. And so um, the, the previous approach was you simplified the equations to get approximate solutions. What you might, that might not be good enough. So to solve very complicated systems of equations, the kind of equations which arise in science and engineering, you may not be able to do it in, in general, you can't do it in pencil and paper. You have to use a computer. So that's one of the major things. The theory, the equations you're trying to solve are simply too complicated, too difficult to solve in pencil and paper. It might be too expensive. So you know, when, you, when you buy a car in Europe, it will have passed some, some crash worthiness test. There will have been a physical test done to make sure that in a crash, the passengers are going to be sufficiently safe. The car is not going to crumple. That's a very expensive experiment to do for two reasons. A, it destroys the car. That's very difficult. B, if you get it wrong, you have to redesign the car, which is, even more, which is even more expensive. So you want to make sure that when you do this physical test, you get your car passes first time. Okay? 
And you can only do that if you can do in silico stimulations beforehand. If you've done a lot of simulations beforehand where you've simulated your car design and made sure or convinced yourself it is going to pass the crash test. So the experiment may be feasible, but maybe too expensive to do. Now, you can argue whether you need to do the, still need to do the physical experiment, whether you would accept a car was roadworthy purely from a numerical simulation, but that's another. Currently, it's, we still require the endpoint of a physical experiment. It may not, might, might, not, might not just not be possible to do. You might, <coughs> excuse me, you might want to understand how volcanoes work. You might want to try and predict when the next, when my net, Etna is going to next erupt. You cannot go into the center of a volcano and, and measure the temperature and the pressure and what the magma is doing. It's not possible to do. <coughs> if you write a computer simulation, you have access to all the information all the time. It may be too big. Okay? So you may be worried about climate change. You might say, you know, is all... Are all the greenhouse gases we're emitting at the moment, are they going to affect the climate in the future? That experiment is you cannot clone the world and then run two worlds, one for 100 years where we, you know, where we, where we carry on the way we are, run for 100 years where we reduce our, our emissions. The only way you can do that experiment, if you want to call it an experiment, is on a computer. So all our predictions about how the climate is going to change in the next 10, 50, 100 years are based on computer simulation. That's the only way it's possible to say or try and predict if we reduce or increase emissions by this amount now, what's going to happen in 10, 50, 100 years' time. It may simply be too small. If you're looking at, I mean, the kind of uh, systems Peter Higgs is looking at, the, 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 um, the particles are so tiny that you just can't, you, you can't actually, it's very difficult to actually see inside them. If you do a computer simulation, it doesn't matter how small it is, you can look inside and see what's going on. Or it may be too far away or too slow. So you might be interested in, in how galaxies collide. You might have a prediction saying, you know, I know what happens when two galaxies collide, which might give you important information about the current universe. You might look up in the night sky and be able to see two galaxies colliding. Well, you're going to have to wait half a billion years for them to actually collide with each other. And so if you want to make studies of th things on the astrophysical scale, you want to study the Big Bang, you want to study the evolution of the universe, the only way you can do it is on computers. And so that's where the driving, the, the, the driving force has come historically over the past few decades. It's been trying to feed the insatiable computational demands of computational science, something which some people would call a third discipline, complementing theory and experiment, which is numerical simulation, which, which still fits into the classical loop, but is, 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 is a, a complementary approach to, to finding out from a particular theory what are the, what are the consequences of it. So I've got a very simple example here, which is a bit of a joke example, but it, does, it is a serious example I'll come back to. What is the world's yearly income? Okay, I want to find out what the world's yearly income is. So luckily I've got a list here, and it's got 7 billion people on it, and it's, got, it's alphabet, alphabetized by country and name, and it's got their salary. So there's a couple of brothers who run a car repair business in Afghanistan, who don't own very much, unfortunately, Adil and Ami Abdali. Then we carry on. I'm on the list there. If we go down to the 5 billionth person, this is good. My salary doesn't seem to be legible, but anyway, I'm on the list. And then we carry on. We can see other people you might recognize, like there's the Queen, who earned £38 million a few years ago. And we get around to the 7 billionth person at the end, and there's a couple of people, Zodj and Zuka Zinyama from Zimbabwe, who earn £3,000. Anyway, so what is, what is the world's yearly income? We need to add up those 7 billion numbers. Okay? That's quite a large calculation. And so what I'm going to use it is I'm going to use it as a kind of a metric for historically how computers have got faster. Okay? So we all know that computers are getting faster, but um, we want to kind of quantify that. So I'm going to use this as an example. So I'm going to write a computer program. So this is my, my canonical computer program. I set the running, I have to have a running total, I set the running total to zero, I start at the top of the list, I add the income to the total, I go to the next item in the list, and I repeat if I'm not at the end of the list, and then I print the total. So very naively what I'm going to say is that this program consists of three instructions. Add income to total, go to the next item in the list, and then check if I'm not at the end of the list. So, so, so this loop requires 7 billion iterations, obviously, one for each salary or income, and each iteration requires three instructions. It's a very naive approach, but okay. How long is that going to take? So what I'm going to use is I'm going to follow, you know, if I'd run this program on various processes over the years, how long would it have taken? And this will illustrate um, 
where, well, I'll try, try and quantify how much faster computers have got in the past few decades. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, start the Intel CPUs, not because there's anything particularly special about Intel CPUs, except A, they're very popular, they're, they're very almost ubiquitous, but B, Intel have been around for a long time. And so we've got a, quite a history of Intel CPUs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, look at what, I'm going to pick a particular Intel CPU, I'm going to tell you what the frequency is, clock frequency, how many operations per second it takes, and then how long it would take to do this loop. So the first one that makes it funny is actually me. If you think of me as a processor created in 1966, I reckon that I could, I could run that program at about one operation per second. My frequency is about one hertz. Okay? So I can do one operation per second, one second per operation. The loop, each loop takes three seconds. And so if you work it out, and that's probably about right, it would take me 650 years to add up that list of numbers, by which time everyone on this would be dead and it would be a useful cal useless calculation. So this is clearly the origin of, of, of computing. You know, mechanical calculations, um, which came about in, in, in you know, everyday life, in business, were not possible, not feasible by humans. Um, although the original, I mean, a computer originally meant a person who did calculations, but it, uh, that, that, that terminology is no longer used. In 1971, Intel came out, which was what I believe is, would, would have been considered the first modern Know, integrated microprocessor, the I4004, it had a frequency of 100 kilohertz. That's 100,000 operations per second. That's 10 microseconds per operation. That's 10, 10 millionths of a second operation. So each loop took 30 microseconds. So that then took two and a half days. So already, you know, over 40 years ago, you know, computers were able to, tr to take, um, processors were able to take calculations, which is simply impossible to do by hand, 650 years down to something which you would go away and leave it running for a few days, okay? But then there's this relentless increase in computer power. So by 1993, Intel brought out the Pentium, which was a very successful processor, and its frequency was 60 megahertz. It was issuing instructions of 60 million operations per second. That's 17 nanoseconds per operation, or the time per loop was 50 nanoseconds. And that means the total time comes down to six minutes. So over those, three, over those two decades, you've gone from a calculation which you would have to set running and go away and come back in days to something where you could go away and come back and have a cup of tea, and it would be done. And then 2012, the um, very modern processor, the Core i7, which had three gigahertz um, uh, clock speed again, um, each loop would then only take a nanosecond, and then this, the total time is calculated in seven seconds. So we've gone from something which took 650 years to something which 40, 50 years ago took two and a half days on a processor down to seven seconds. And it's not, these numbers are quite staggering, actually. I mean, people get very blasé nowadays. Oh, my, my, my laptop is only a gigahertz processor. Okay. So in a light, which is the fastest thing there is, only travels 30 centimeters a nanosecond. So, so in, in, in the time it takes a Core i7, a modern processor multi operating at many gigahertz um, of clock frequency, it can issue, in the time it takes to issue an instruction, light has only traveled 10 centimeters, okay? So you can see that we're getting down to fa some fairly fundamental physical limits in processing. You know, that is bigger than a, than, a, than a processor, but it's not a lot bigger than a processor. So, you know, light only travels that far in the time it takes a modern processor to issue an instruction. So I've talked about time here. I want to convert this into performance. So I've just got some graphs here. So I'm going to say my performance was one. You know, my speed was one. And what you see is that over the years, you get this exponential increase in, in performance. And it gets so big that, of course, I have to, I have to uh, redraw the scale. And so as processors got faster and faster, I have to redo the scale here, shrink it down. By 1990, they were getting 300 times faster than 30,000. 2005, so by 2005, the raw evolution of, of processor technology, which was driving these, these clock speeds, processors are getting faster and faster and faster. By 2005, if I'd taken that computer program and run it, it would have run around 30,000 times faster than it did in 1971, okay? So this was, this was the golden age, okay? If you wanted your program to go faster, you went away, waited a year, and came back, and it went faster, okay? However, if you look, if I took that same program and ran it on a chip in 2005, in 2010, I'd have got the same speed. If I took that program and ran it in 2005, it would have been 30,000 times faster than my baseline, which is the 1971 I4004. 2010, the same program 
which has still only gone 30,000 times faster. This, this increase has stopped. Now, that seems counterintuitive because we all know that computers got more powerful between 2010 and 2005. Okay? So if computers are getting more powerful, why is my program not going any faster? Why did things stall in 2005? Why was 2005 was a critical year, effectively? Well, the reason is that this drive to, to increase um, frequency, faster computers, is, is, is driven by transistor density. So that's a picture of, of the I-4004. And, and I, I'm not a hardware engineer, but you can almost count. There are 2,000 transistors there. You can almost count them. You know, I mean, you, you could probably sit down and count these transistors. But very early on, actually, back in the 60s, Gordon Moore, who founded Intel, had, had noticed that, that, that ma manufacturing technology, that, that the physical technology which was used to produce computer processors was enabling you to double the number of transistors on a silicon chip every two years. Every two years, roughly, you were able to put twice as many transistors on the same physical piece of silicon. And that translates, for, for relatively non-trivial reasons, but it translates into a doubling of the frequency. You can think of it, if you've got twice as many transistors, they're closer together. So they, it's half the time for them to talk to each other. It's not quite that simple. But, but, but doubling of transistor density, if I can put twice as many transistors on a piece of silicon, I can double the clock frequency. And that happens for, for decades. And so if we look at 1993, we're up to 3 million transistors. Okay? We look at 2004, we're up to 100 million transistors. You can't see the individual transistors here. But I said something, fu something funny happened around 2005. If I, so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an Intel processor. I don't know exactly which one, but a, 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 some kind of Pentium processor from 2004. So, so in 1993, we built this chip, had 3 million transistors. In 2004, we, our, our, our engineers, our, who, the people who designed these chips, were able to put 30 times as many transistors on. So then a couple of years later, we said, well, you, you can now put 200 million transistors on. Okay? What did they do? Oh, well, there's something weird going on there. Okay? So if you look, in 2004, I built this very complicated silicon chip, which had 100 million transistors. And I went to my engineers and said, I can now give you 200 million transistors. What did they do? They just gave me two of the same thing. You don't have to be a hardware engineer to notice that that's a single chip. It looks suspiciously like two chips stuck together on the same piece of silicon. And that's what happened around about 2005, that um, it became, and I'll cover why, it became... Uh, practical, it became impractical to, to continue increasing the, the frequency of the CPUs. Okay? So when you're able to put twice as many transistors on a piece of silicon, rather than producing a processor which had twice the frequency, you simply produce two processors which have the same frequency. And the reason is that a dual core processor has the same frequency but has less power and less heat. The way that the um, the way that the power consumption, which is the same thing as the heat dissipation, the heat scales with the frequency means that it, it, it just becomes, above about 2 or 3 gigahertz, it just becomes practically impossible. To, you could build a much faster chip. You could build a 6, 10, 12 gigahertz chip, but it would just probably overheat. And, and the, the mass market for processors is not for supercomputers. It's for domestic devices like my laptop, this, this, this machine here. So, you know, you don't want to have a laptop which burns your trousers, okay? You don't want to have something which requires external cooling. So, so, so clock frequency stagnated around about 2005 um, at a couple of gigahertz. And that's just been the, the way it's been. What's happened is manufacturers have used this. Moore's law continues. Moore's law is a statement about how many transistors you can put on a physical piece of silicon. And what... What has happened is people are just replicating, putting multiple, fetching multiple processes on the same piece of silicon. And so the reason that my program between 2005 and 2010 didn't go any faster was it was just a normal serial program. It could only run on one of these cores. So if, I'd run, if I was to run my program on this modern dual core chip, it might have run on that core, it might have run on that core, but the other one would have been idle. So the program, as I wrote it, the performance of serial normal programs, norm, serial programs, stagnated around 2005. So I've introduced, introduced this term serial. Serial is, a, this is a definition from the Oxford English Dictionary, as attributed to computing or a process running on a single task. So basically, I wrote a, a program which was just a single program, a single task, and that can only be run on a single processor at once. What we do to, to, to make use of these multiple cores is we use parallel computing. Parallel pro computing or parallel processing, this is quite a nice definition, a mode of operation in which a process, 
okay, it's a slightly unfortunate term, but I'll call that a, a task. It's split into many parts which are executed simultaneously on different processes attached to the same computer. So if you have a problem and you want to make use of a modern computer, you have to not only say, how can I make it run as efficiently as possible? You have to say, how can I split the calculation up to use the multiple CPUs which every modern processor gives me? Now, thankfully, for, for trivial calculation, like adding up the world's income, it, it's very straightforward to see how to do it. It turns out that for the kind of calculations we, we do in scientific and technical computing, there are most many problems admit fairly standard ways of parallelizing them. And I'll cover that next week with a very simple example. Um, to do, I'll introduce it this week to do with traffic modeling, but, but it's, as a, it's a nice conceptual basis to think about how would you take this problem and, and make use of multiple processors. But for the very simple example of, of, of adding up the numbers, it's very simple. So we've got this processor here, okay? The old processor was that one. My new one's got two. What do I do? Well, luckily, because of the way that addition works, I can split my calculation into two parts. I can say, I can, write, I can still write one program. I'm running one program, but I'm running it simultaneously. Sorry, I write one program, but I run it simultaneously on both cores. So both cores are running the same program, but you just put if statement. You say, if I'm core one, then the total one is the sum of the top half of the list. If I'm core two, the total is the sum of the, top, of the bottom half of the list. And it's important that this, this algorithm to compute the sum is the same algorithm as I used before. Okay? It's just applied to a, a subset of the data. So parallel computing is often not about writing. This isn't always true, but if you're lucky, it's not about writing and inventing new algorithms. It's simply about taking out existing algorithms and partitioning them, kind of divide and conquer type approach. So I could run the same function. I just apply it to half the list. But then there is an overhead. Parallel computing doesn't come for free. And the important point is, before I compute the, the final total, I have to add these numbers together, which means both of the cores have to have finished. I have to wait for both cores to finish, and then the total is the total 1 plus total 2, and I print the total. Now, in this nice example where I can split the list into two halves, that's not too much of an issue. But if, if, if one core took longer than the other one, then that waiting would introduce an overhead. And so that's, that's one of the main reasons why parallel computing isn't completely trivial, it isn't, isn't a universal panacea, that by having to take, having to, to, to split your calculation up amongst multiple processors, um, there, there are inevitable overheads. And one of these is synchronization, and that would happen if, if one of the cores was running faster than the other ones. Or you hadn't split the list into, into halves. Or maybe one half had lots of zeros in it, for example. So, so, so it's carried on, and a, a more modern chip, this is still from four or five years ago, had four billion transistors on it. Uh, you can count, and there are 32 cores on there. So, this is, so modern processors are on multiple. That, that, that for this kind of level, the new terminology is really many core, actually. But you know, modern processors are multi-core, and even your mobile phone will probably have multiple cores in it. And so the bottom line is, if you want to do large calculations, you need to use parallelism. You need to split your calculation up because you are not... There's no, there's no longer a free ride. You can't go away and wait for a year until processors get faster because processors are not getting any faster. And so if I redraw that graph, okay, 2005, I went 30,000 times faster. In 2010, if I had a quad-core chip, which is what I would get um, from the evolution of Moore's law, I would go 120,000 times faster. It's very important to note that from 2000 to 2005, I was using a serial program, and that increase came from the increase in the clock speed. From 2005 to 2010, that increase came from parallelizing my program and using four times as many cores, not from using the same processor which had four times the clock frequency. And this is carrying on. So Moore's law is, is carrying on, but it's translating into, into more and more processors, whether you want them or not. And so we've seen that if we take a, a, a chip a multi-core chip and a parallel program, we get a fast algorithm. All that supercomputing does is, well, I don't care how fast your processor is, I don't care how many cores it's got, I'm just going to stick lots of them together. And so a parallel supercomputer just says, well, I'll, I'll buy lots of processors. I'll buy lots of them, stick them together, and if I can use a clever enough algorithm, um, then I will be able to get um, super fast speed. And what we're going to cover in the lecture after probably... Um, round about the, the break is, is how 
these machines are constructed. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll be after the, the, the break at, half, at 3 o'clock. For those who are online who may have missed the start, I'm going to lecture from 2 to 3, then take a coffee break until half 3, and then lecture again from half 3 to half 4. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cover the basic ways that we take multiple processes, multiple cores, and put them together. So just a couple of examples. This is a, a historical machine which doesn't actually, it, which was decommissioned a few years ago, but this was the, the, the previous um, um, system to Archer. It was called Hector. It was quite, quite an elegant system. It had about 5,000 CPUs, 90,000 cores. You can see that each CPU therefore had 16 cores. Um, it had 90,000 gigabytes, and it took about a megawatt of power. And that's, that's a useful figure because a megawatt of power costs about a million pounds a year. That's a kind of a ballpark. So a megawatt is enough to power a small village, town of a few thousand houses. So these machines take a lot of power, a lot of power and a lot of money uh, to run. So even the electricity bill for a modern supercomputer is, is um, in the millions of, of pounds or euros every, every year. This was superseded by Cray, and it has, okay, so what we're going to do is that we're going to buy lots of processors and we're going to connect them. It turns out they still have to communicate with each other, um, and the way they do that is over interconnects. Some, some networking, I'll we'll come back to how this works, but uh, Hector had a very fast network. This was superseded by the Cray XC30. It was also a Cray machine, um, which is... Um, got a nice design on it. And the current machine, which you're able to get accounts on, has about uh, 10,000 CPUs, 118,000 cores, because, um, uh, and um, it has about 300,000 gigabytes, 300 terabytes of memory, but it still takes about a megawatt of power. And that's because um, these, um, and you can work out from that, each CPU probably has about 12 cores on it. Um, a modern supercomputer center is fundamentally limited, not by physical space, but by the power it can draw. You know, you have a limited, you know, power draw. You know, it's very difficult to get, I mean, a few megawatts is possible, but that your limit to how big a supercomputer can be is really the power it draws. And that's why power efficiency is, is such a critical factor in modern supercomputing. Uh, a, because, of course, for any computer, you'd like it to be cheaper. Okay, so for any ch the more power efficient a computer is, the cheaper it is to run. But more importantly, the more power efficient a computer is, the bigger computer you can build with a fixed power budget. And that's really the driving force between, uh, uh, in modern supercomputing, making things low power, because your limiting factor is the amount of electricity you can afford to pump into your supercomputer center. Um, so the way it works, I... I, I um, I said that, you know, for this adding up the incomes um, uh, example, it was very, very simple. We could just split the list into two. It turns out that the way the physical simulations work, the same approach applies. And so a classic example of computer simulation, which you come across every day, although you may not realize it, is weather forecasting. When you look at the, the BBC, the Met Office weather forecast for tomorrow, it is done on a parallel supercomputer. Actually, it's done on a Cray, very similar to Archer. And the way that these models work is they take a map of... Of, of, of um, here, Great Britain, uh, the UK and, and, and Ireland, and you effectively split it up into patches. This is a somewhat naive, but that's the, fact, the fundamental approach is to split up whatever system you are simulating into a number of independent patches, and then to simulate them on different processes or using different... So you're splitting up the calculation analogous to the way we can divide the list up into different portions. And these are then um, simulated. Now, of course, these are not simulated independently. We have wind, weather travels, okay? So, so these you know, patches need to communicate with each other, and that is where you need a network. You need to communicate information between, between patches, which here, each patch corresponds to a separate processor or, 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 or computer, if you can think of it that way. But it turns out that the way, and we'll, this will be illustrated by the, um, the, the traffic modeling example I'm going to introduce today, it turns out that the way that most or a large class of physical simulations work, the communications is local. A patch only needs to communicate with its neighbors. Because you can think in a, in, in, in a five, ten minute um, um, interval, the wind is not strong enough to blow more than a few, you know, I don't know, 
tens of a, a, more than a kilometer or so. And so it turns out that each patch likely only needs information from its nearest neighbors. And that will turn out to be one of the critical observations of large-scale physical simulations. If you're lucky and you have some kind of locality where each patch only depends on its neighbors, you have a limited, you have a, you have a, a constrained amount of communication. The communication doesn't explode. And we'll, but again, I've got a specific example which hopefully illustrates that, um, which we'll cover at the end of today. That's not always the case, though. If you wanted to submit the planet, the nine pla I'm old enough that I think that Pluto is a planet, so there are nine planets um, orbiting the sun. You wanted to simulate these planets. You might say, well, I'll just do the same thing. I'll split space up into four regions, okay? But there you've got a problem, that if you've got four processors, the guy in the bottom right has not, got nothing to do. The guy in the top right has got a lot to do, and the guy in the top left has got a lot, quite a lot to do. And so this is a problem which is load imbalanced. You know, you can't... The, 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 I said that the... the there are, although you might want to split the calculation up, it's actually important that you get all the processors busy. So if some of the processors have nothing to do, then you've wasted, your, you've wasted your effort. And so in this situation, you can't do this physical domain decomposition. You can't take the simulation region and split it up into, into pieces. You have to do something different. Here you have to do a, a, de a decomposition of the problem based on particles. So you would say, well, imagine I have three processors. I'll give the first three planets to processor one, the, re the red processor, the next three planets to, to the green processor, and the final three planets, which unfortunately have disappeared off the end, to, to, to the blue processor. And so, you know, it's not always different approaches to need different, different situations, but the fundamental method of parallel computing is to take your calculation, split it up into hopefully equal pieces, distribute them, and hopefully the overhead of that is small. And so the way I think of, of, of computers that they're modern parallel supercomputers, are like, they're like a universal experiment. And we can build microscopes to look at things that are very small. We can build the Hubble telescope to look at things that are very far away. We can build um, these amazing sky cranes to land, well, sometimes, sometimes land things on, on, on Mars. Um, but these are amazing instruments. They all have a specific purpose. The point about a supercomputer is it's like a blank screen. You buy your supercomputer. It's a universal experiment. The way you get it to do things is you write software. And so although I've talked quite a lot about hardware here, a modern computational scientist, somebody who does scientific computing, is really, what they do is they, they write software. This is a modern observation that by the back door, scientists have turned into software developers. Unfortunately, often not trained software developers, which is another point, but that, that's what's happened. So, um, you know, the computer is provided by a bunch of people uh, who may have computer science, designed by computer scientists, the operators designed by computer scientists, presented, but to a computational scientist, someone doing scientific computing, it's like a blank screen and you write software. Now, I have a whole bunch of simulations here, um, but I wanted to just kind of skip over them. Uh, there is a, hopefully, these, these kind of tax my, my la this laptop, but this is actually, I'll show this one, this is a, a simulation of, of the universe from, since the Big Bang, and basically what you do is you simulate billions and billions of particles which correspond to, to galaxies, and you watch how they evolve over time. So what we're seeing here is the evolution over billions of years. And what you see as you run your computer simulation is that under gravity, the matter collapses, and you form galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And with very few variable parameters, um, you get your simulation produces something, and how do you check your simulation is right? You look up at the night sky and say, does, does my simulation look like the night sky? And it does. You get these long filaments and amazing structures. And it's through experiments, it's through numerical, well, not solely, but, but, but partially through numerical experiments like this, that people have recognized that, that, that there's dark matter out there. You don't get the right, the universe does not look correct unless you stick in 90% of stuff that you don't know what it is. But hey, it makes your simulation correct, so you're happy. So the only way we get these correct pictures is through sticking in, saying that 90, well, there's even dark energy now, that most of the universe we know nothing about, but we know it uh, interacts under gravity. There was one other simulation I wanted to show you. Um, be, but I, as I said, this, this, the animation is somewhat taxing, so I'll try and jump to it straight away, which I think is just to show you that, that there is a very large... Um, spectrum of science that goes on. Um, it, we, we, we find dinosaur skeletons, okay? You can go find a dinosaur skeleton, okay? So you can see, you can, you can look at what it looked like, how big it was. But how did it walk? You've got a four-legged dinosaur. Did it walk on two legs or four legs? Okay, how could you know that? Well, what you can do 
is you can take the, the skeleton and you can model how the um, how the, the the muscles. You know how big the muscles were because you've got. I believe you can see from the, from the bone structure. You can you can you can infer how big the muscles were, and then you can run loads and loads of computer simulations, simulating thousands and thousands of different gates, different ways that the dinosaur could have run, and assume that the the the, 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 the mode of of of, of, of locomotion, which is most energy efficient, was the one which, which, which it took. So these people are doing studies of dinosaur skeletons to try and work out how, whether, how did dinosaurs walk. This is a hadrosaur. Did it walk on four legs like that? Did it maybe... Uh, these, did it run on two legs like that? Or possibly did it even hop like that? Okay. And it turns out that... Uh, the most energy, I believe the most energy efficient um, configuration is the hopping, but this dinosaur did not hop because if you work it out, its legs aren't strong enough. So if the dinosaur has hopped, its legs would have broken. So um, in fact, I believe the answer is that dinosaur, this, had, this dinosaur ran on four legs, uh, on two legs, sorry, ran on two legs like that. And of course, you can verify these models because you can input the, the, the skeletal structure of a kangaroo, a horse you know, uh, an elephant, and check you get the right answer for modern-day animals. So these are the kind of things, you know, uh, classically, computational science, high performance computing is associated with things like, you know, heavy engineering, designing aeroplanes, um, cosmology and astrophysics, subatomic physics, stuff like that. But it, it's much more applicable than that. And I'm trying to illustrate here that it really is a universal experiment. If you're clever enough to write the software, you can do what you like. And it may not be obvious that this, is a, that this, this problem requires supercomputing, but it does because the, the, the simulation of the gate, the motion of a single dinosaur is difficult, but you have to sample thousands and thousands of different possible motions to find out which is the, the most efficient. So, what I was going to do before the, um, the break was to very briefly, um, this is a, a slight, of, I said that we brought various uh, courses, uh, lectures from various courses together to, 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 to give you an overview of computational science and scientific computing. Um, but I'll just, I'll try and complete, I'll, I'll start this lecture actually. I probably won't get it finished before the break. But this is really just high performance computing. Was it used for and why? Okay. So this repeats some of the stuff I said before. But I'll talk a bit about the drivers. And I'll try and explain why you need to learn about this stuff. Okay? You might say, you know, well, I don't really, I mean, as a naive, myself, a naive scientist, you might think, I, I, I don't really need to know how my computer is built. I just want to write software. It turns out that, with in the current state of high performance computing parallel computers, you do need to know a bit about how your computer is built, otherwise you won't be able to use it particularly efficiently. Okay. So we'll talk a bit about the hardware layout. The hardware layout and the structure matters. Um, if you appreciate the fundamentals, it allows you to get more from high performance computing, scientific computing. It will allow you to say, you know, I've got this calculation to do. Which of these three machines is going to be most likely uh, best, is going to be good for me? Is it even worth using high performance computing? Is it even worth taking my program and parallelizing it? So some drivers, we've talked about this. Scientific simulations drive the need for greater computing. Single core processes aren't, aren't being made any faster. Um, and actually, um, so making processes with faster clock speeds is difficult due to cost and power limitations. Also, sh a memory is difficult to put vast amounts of memory on a single processor. It's easier to buy, put lots of computers together if you want large amounts of memory. So we've seen in parallel computing, we divide up the work amongst numerous linked systems. And in fact, the best, th this course works better actually if I'm in, in a computing lab. The best conceptual model you can have for a modern parallel machine is a bunch of laptops connected by a network. Okay? So, we'll come, so a bunch of multi-core laptops, and I've talked a bit about this, we'll come back later to what that really means, connected together by a network. That is your best conceptual model for what a modern parallel computer looks like. That is what it is. It's a bunch of separate computers connected by some network. The computers themselves aren't particularly special. The processes in the computers aren't particularly special. Um, but it's, the it's, it's having lots of them linked together, um, which allows us to get the power, well, uh, potentially to get the power to solve the, the kind of problems we want to solve in modern, modern computational science. Bit of terminology. Each laptop is called a compute node. 
you can imagine that we've got some kind of graph here. We've got, we can think of the network as, a, as, 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 as links and um, as edges and, and the, the laptops as being vertices. So you can think of this as a graph of connectivity. So the terminology has come around that when we talk about supercomputers, we talk about nodes. A node is the endpoint of the network, which in this case is a single laptop. Okay? But you'll hear, them, you'll hear people will, talk, will typically say the word node. How many nodes does your supercomputer have? How many processors does each node have? Okay? In this analogy, it's how many laptops are there. So if we had a quad-core laptop, if each laptop had four processors, this would have 20 processor cores. Okay? But physically, it's not enough to say, I have 20 separate processor cores on my, on my, in my parallel computer, because here you can see there's a distinction that there's five groups of four. Four of them are, on, are a multi-core. We'll come back a bit to what this means, but four of them are is a multi-core processor single in the same computer, and the other factor of five comes from just sticking five computers together. And so uh, we've covered some of these examples already. Um, a bit of statistics here. This is a new slide, actually, which a colleague of mine put together to look at the use of statistics on the UK National Service. Now, this might be quite surprising. Um, the thing which might surprise you most is that um, programming language usage, 84% of the usage of the UK National Service is in a language called Fortran, which to a modern computer scientist will seem like some kind of dinosaur language. Now, that's, that's not true. In fact, modern Fortran is relatively sophisticated. But this actually is slightly, slightly disingenuous because what it means is that 84% of the computation of Archer is done, um, is done um, using programs written in Fortran. But it doesn't mean that people all write Fortran. Uh, software has a long lifetime. Software lasts for decades. Computers last for a few years. So modern computational science, um, yeah, let's have also advanced, I have to turn this off. A lot of co computational scientists don't actually write software. There are communities of scientists who develop very sophisticated packages which allow other people to use them as if they were experiments. And you'll see on the right-hand side that material science, which is studying composition of new materials at the molecular level, is a big field on Archer. A lot of these big packages have been around for a long time, and for historical reasons have written in Fortran. So in fact, uh, Andy Turner, who did this, looked at the development. In fact, the vast majority of development work on Archer is done using C, C++. The, C, the C++ compiler is called many, many more times the Fortran compiler. However, the centrally installed packages, which allow you to do computations without writing your own software, are written in Fortran. And also, Fortran was designed for scientific and technical computing. Although we, you might argue that C++ is equally featured now, when these packages were first designed maybe 20 years ago, um, the only real option was to get performance was to use Fortran, although that is changing. Um, why do I need to know all this stuff? Well, as I said, high-performance computing has is, is, is been synonymous with parallel computing for, the, for, for, for many decades, for over two decades. The only way you could make a powerful computer was not to buy a powerful processor, but to use lots of powerful processors. And if you understand the way that parallel programming works, um, allows you to understand how to use HPC resources effectively. And we'll see there are two fundamentally different parallel programming models one based on shared memory, one based on distributed memory. And there's, an, there's a linkage between the programming model you use and the hardware you're using. And you need to understand that to, do, to get the, right, the best out of your computer. Um, if you understand the way that HPC hardware is laid out, it allows you to do things, as I said, choose the right resource, choose the appropriate resource for your application, understand different ways to parallelize your application, and appreciate for the parts that are important for performance. When you're going to parallelize a calculation, if you have some understanding about what kind of hardware you're going to run it on, it will give you, it'll allow you to more likely to come up with the best parallel approach. There's always more than one approach to solving a problem. There's always more than one approach to, way to parallelize a problem. But if you understand a bit about the hardware, even at the conceptual level, you can pick the right algorithm from, from the outset. Also, um, we won't go to it much in this this course, um, but you need to understand serial computing to understand parallel computing. There is no point parallelizing a program of a thousand of processors if you aren't making the, the best use of each processor. Okay? You, wanna, you don't want to use multiple processors until you've made the best use of each processor. And so how the compiler works, 
how the operating system deals with processes and threads and such like can be um, quite important. We'll only touch on that in this course. But it is important to know that, you know, to get a program running quickly, not only do you need to parallelize it across thousands of processors, you need to make sure that on your individual processor it is running efficiently. And that is not easy because modern computer architectures are so, so complicated. Even, on the, even a single core has a very, very complicated architecture. I've I kind of thrown away the words performance here. Um, well, the, the, the terminology you'll, you'll um, hear thrown around a lot is, is FLOPs. FLOP stands for floating point operation per second. Scientific and technical computing is dominated by adding, by real numbers, okay, or complex numbers, but adding real numbers together. So you might want to add two numbers together or multiply two numbers together. Each of those operations is called a single floating point operation, one FLOP. Um, so a FLOP is a one floating point operation per second, okay? So adding two numbers, and a modern processor can do, can at least issue the instruction for these in a single cycle. It can say, multiply these two 64-bit floating point numbers together, please. That's a single operation, or adding them is a single operation. Division and square roots and things are a bit more hard, but we'll forget about them. And so a floating point operation, operation is one addition or one multiplication per second. And modern supercomputers are measured, well, kilo, mega, giga, tera. Modern, the, the, the computing performance of modern supercomputers like Archer is measured in the petaflops. That's 10 to the 12 a million, million um, um, operations per second. Uh, the next um, um, milestone is exaflops, which is, um, uh, so that is, that is seen as the next kind of barrier to super. We're currently in the, in the multiple petaflop region. The next breakthrough will be to get a computer which could do an exaflop, which would be 10 to the 15 um, calculations per second. You can use runtime. I mean, I used runtime for my previous example, 60, 650 years down to whatever it was, six seconds. Um, other disciplines have their own me performance measures. So for scientific and technical computing, people normally talk about flops. If you were doing gaming, you talk about frames per second. If you were a bank, you'd be concerned about database access per second. Okay? But in scientific and technical computing, flops is, is kind of is the... Is the um, the standard measure. And there is actually, there, there's a website called the Top 500 List, which, um, which ranks the world's fastest supercomputers by their performance. And the performance which is used is, um, is, is flops. So I've come, to, I'm about to go to, so I'll stop there because this is the next section, but I thought that would give me a chance actually that I could just, um, I could actually show you that website. I've taught, might be useful quite fun. It's called the Top 500 List, top500.org. Um, and you can see here, it's full of lots of articles, but there are lists. So the most recent list was in November last year. And we can see here's a list of the world's fastest supercomputers. Um, the Chinese have built, have the, the two fastest supercomputers in the world. Um, and um, so the, the Previously, they had this thing called, um, um, I can't remember how, Tian here, I, I can't remember how to pronounce it, apologies. Uh, I think it's Tian here, uh, which had um, 3 million cores. Uh, its, it, its power consumption was 17 megawatts. Okay, it's a lot of power. But its peak performance was 54 petaflops. That's 54 times 10 to the 12 floating point operation per second, which is a big number. Um, the Americans decided to not, this is built with uh, American built chips, Intel chips. And the Americans decided to have an embargo, for various reasons, have an embargo and wouldn't sell the Chinese any more of their own chips. And so the Chinese went away and built their own chip and came up, which was one of the most, the, the fastest computer in the world today, which has over 10 million cores, um, a peak performance of over 100 petaflops, a slightly smaller power budget, still, so, 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 my guess would be the power, the power bill for this machine would be of order 15 million pounds a year. Okay, that's how much it would cost to keep this computer running. Uh, but it, you know the numbers are staggering. It has each processor, as you see, the clock. Each processor isn't very special. The clock speed is about one and a half gigahertz, which is probably less than you've got on your laptop. But there are 10 million of them, all in the same infrastructure, which allows you to achieve these staggering performances of here 
uh, uh, and I should have worked out how long it would add up to add, or, add up all the all the um, all the salaries in the world with that with that performance. But I, I, it would probably yeah it would take yeah milli milliseconds presumably to do. So again, top500.org is worth looking at, especially as there'll be a new list in the next month. It's biannual. There's a big supercomputing conference um, in in Europe, uh, the International Supercomputing Conference in um, in late June. And the new top 500 list will be announced there. So there will be a race to try and get um, get the. I don't know who it'll be. I don't know if there's a new computer coming along to beat this computer. I'm not sure. Um, we're on this list somewhere, a bit further down. But there are there are Cray machines here. There's a very large Cray machine uh, at the fifth position in the in the in the, in the inter Okay, so what I'll do is, that's, that's the first hour, I'll, I'll stop lecturing now and I'll come back at half three. What I'll do after half three is I'll just finish off this, this lecture, then I'll very briefly, well, I'll cover the fundamental concept of how do we put these processor cores together in a modern parallel computer, and there are two fundamental ways, shared and distributed memory, and then I'll cover the two examples which I want you to think about in terms of exercises. One is a shrink-wrapped example, a piece of code which I just want you to run, which you can run anywhere, but the exercise is to run it on Archer. It's really just to check that, you can, that your account is set up correctly, you know how to submit jobs. The other exercise is, a, is, is to write a piece of code, just a serial piece of code, to simulate this traffic model I'm going to introduce. That might seem a bit off of a tangent, but hopefully it's interesting, but also that's my canonical model for how to parallelize a calculation. So if you've written a serial program to solve the traffic model, which is really quite straightforward, it then gives you something concrete to think about when you want to parallelize it. But I'll cover that. So I'll start lecturing again at half past three. Okay, so I was just going to finish off that previous lecture very quick. There's only a few, a very couple of slides to go. Just to sort of say the way that HPC systems are laid out, the way, I mean... Um, it's strange, actually, you know, 15, 20 years ago, people were very, very familiar with logging on to external systems. The machine, you didn't have portable computing. Your, your desktop in your, on your office was probably very low-powered, so you used it like a dumb terminal to log on. Since then, laptops and desktops become so powerful, people do a lot more of the computing locally. But, um, but, but high performance computing is sort of more um, old-school that you don't log on. First of all, you don't log on to the, um, the, 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 you have to log on remotely to the computer. But you don't tend to log on to compute nodes directly. And there may be hundreds of thousands of cores on there, but you log on to some front end system, and we'll cover this a bit in the next lecture. It'll become more obvious when you see the example. You log on to some front end system, and you interact with the computer via batch scheduling system. You, don't, you basically say, I would like to run this job. I would like to run a job. I want to run on 10,000 cores, and it's going to, I think it's going to, the job's going to last for an hour. You post that, and then the, 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 there's a batch system, a scheduling system, which, which manages those requests. And so, you know, it's a batch system. You submit requests, and then the turnaround is sometime in the future. It's not GUI-based. Um, you share the system with many users. So, again, it's a multi-user system, although um, hopefully you don't, you don't actually share the compute resources with, with multiple users. The, you, you will be have exclusive access to, to a compute node when you use it. But at any one time, there can be hundreds of people logged onto the system. And also, the resources are very tightly monitored and controlled. So you have a very tightly controlled disk quota. You have CPU usage. You'll see when you do the example, you have to specify a magic code, which for, for this course is y 14 scicomp Hopefully, that should be in the, the default uh, templates I give you. So whenever you run a job on the, on the computer, the time you use is decremented from some budget which you've been allocated, which will then run out at some point. So everything is very, very tightly controlled. Um, so as I said, the typical thing is that you log in to some login, some front-end nodes. Um, there are some compute nodes, which so the login nodes are fairly standard systems, just fairly, you know, standard Linux servers probably. The compute nodes are the more specialized, which there'll be hundreds of thousands, well, the thousands of compute nodes. And you will, you'll interact with that via the batch system. You won't log on to them directly. You, 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 you submit a job. You compile and submit a job to be run. They will share disk, which allows you to, to, to share data between them, but you don't have direct access. Software usage, as I said, is fairly, you know, you write the code, you compile it, you submit it to the, 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 um, the machine, and then you do bugs and new features, and you, you maybe do analysis off, offline. Um, actually, this is a... This implies that the that the um, the uh, edit compile run cycle is done on 
something like Archer. This would have been true exclusively 10 or 15 years ago, but um, supercomputing has gone very mainstream in the sense that we tend to use Linux operating system, you can use GNU compilers. Uh, so in fact, you can replicate effectively the software environment of a supercomputer on your laptop. So in, in, in fact, a lot of people will be doing this, uh, this uh, edit, compile, run cycle mostly on their laptop or on a local system and only when you know, they, they get some major version or want to test performance, they'll go onto the supercomputer. So that has been a big change in the past decade or so that, that you can basically do um, parallel software development on your laptop. And if you do it correctly, you can transfer it and then run it on, on, a, on a very large supercomputer. The summary is that, I mean, the most important point is that high performance computing equals parallel computing. This, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double whammy. There's a stagnation in clock speed since maybe mid-2000s, 2005, which means that you won't, your program won't get any faster just by buying a new computer unless it's parallel. However, even pre-2005, you know, back in the 90s, we had parallel computing because no matter how fast the processor is, many of them will be faster. Okay? So, you know, uh, parallel computing has gone from something like something of more niche topic, only really applicable at the high end, to much more every day because every computer you buy is a parallel computer. You run a multiple processor course at the same time, and we'll cover the, the hardware aspects of that in the next lecture and the software aspects of that. What, what are the programming models you can use to harness the power of multiple processor cores next week? The processors themselves are fairly standard, but we use many thousands of them. And the thing which really differentiates a very high-end supercomputer from a, a more everyday cluster is the fast network. And we'll, again, come back to some specific examples of that. Um, now, what I wanted to do now is really talk a bit about the architecture of how machines are put together. What, what kinds of machines are there and how are they used? So I'll talk about shared memory architectures, distributed memory architectures, um, the combination of the two, and I'll talk a bit about accelerators. I may talk about file systems. There's a couple of slides there, but I'll see how the timing is going. And then I'll, I'll give a sort of an overview, a very, very brief overview of the kind of um, uh, systems, the, the way we classify systems, just to, in, to, to really sort of, uh, uh, at least in the UK anyway, to give you some understanding of what the terminology means. So the first architecture for parallel computing is a shared memory. Uh, the simplest to use, so it be, it, the world would be a much nicer place if all machines were shared memory machines, but it's the hardest to build. So... The, the way that a shared memory architecture works is that you have multiple processors all sharing the same memory, directly attached to the same physical piece of memory. And um, this has been around since the early 90s. In the early 90s, people bought, you would buy, sing, or you could only get single core processors in the early 90s. So you bought lots of single core processors, but you built some special uh, motherboard which allowed you to have multiple sockets and, and, and connect them together to um, a common memory system. But the important point about a shared memory system really as a user is a single operating system controls the entire shared memory system. It's like your laptop. Your laptop may have two cores, four cores in it. Okay? There are multiple physical processors in your laptop, but you don't see that as a user directly. It's often actually quite hard to find out how many processors, physical cores there are in your laptop because the operating system is in control of all of them. And that's what makes shared memory computing slightly easier. The operating system is there to help you. Um, modern multi-core processors are just shared memory systems on a single chip. That's really, architecturally, they're no different from the machines we had back in the 90s. It's just that they come pre-stamped. So this is the, really the architecture which you should think of that um, a classic symmetric multiprocessing architecture, SMP, has a single block of memory and multiple processors or processor cores. I'm being slightly, um, uh, slightly lax with the terminology. Um, I should never say processor core there. But, you know, I've got one, two, three, four, five cores. This could be like your laptop. Your laptop would have maybe four cores. But all the processor cores in your laptop are connected to the same block of memory. But they're done... done the, the, the simple way of doing that is through a shared bus. They all share access to the memory. So each, each, the reason it's called a symmetric multiprocessor architecture is that the memory is a single block of memory. Each processor has access to that, but they're all equal. They all have to go through the bus to get access to the memory. Okay? 
And so there's uh, all cores have the same access to memory, and that's probably how your multi -core, a multi-core laptop is um, is designed. It just turns out in a multi-core laptop, all these processor cores are probably stamped out on the single on the same piece of silicon. But that's really a sort of a, a manufacturing detail you don't care about. But you can see immediately what the what the issue with this is. Um, that there is a bottleneck here, and, and my, my my conceptual model for this is um, four or five people in the same office with a shared whiteboard. Okay, they have a whiteboard on the wall, but you've got multiple people in the office who have to access that whiteboard. It's actually quite a good analogy, but you can see immediately there's a problem. That basically everybody has to go through. There's a single bottleneck here, and so if lots of people try and access the memory at the same time, there's going to be contention, and it turns out that. Um, memory access speeds have have gone up way way slower than, than than clock speeds, and so modern computers are limited for, for scientific and technical. Not the unique thing, but one of the defining features about scientific and technical programming, the kind of calculations we do in computational science, is we access a lot of memory. Okay, we have huge arrays. We're going through. We're simulating the weather on a very fine grid across the whole of the UK. We've got millions, billions of data points. That means we're doing a huge amount of memory access. Memory access is cripplingly slow these days, and we've just made it worse. This memory access is, is bad, and now we've stuck four or five processors on it. So modern scientific and technical programs are limited, almost universal, not universal, but, but, but most of them are limited by memory access. You simply cannot read and write the data fast enough. Now, we don't have to have time to go into it here in detail. There are ways around that. There's a little block here, which you may want. That's, that's supposed to indicate cache memory. So processors have cache memory, which in the analogy of this being a shared whiteboard and these being office workers, it's like having your own notebook. Okay? So when you read data, you get a local copy of it. You won't have your own cache. Access to the cache is fast. Okay? That sounds great. Unfortunately, you might want to write data. And when you write data, you, if you update your cache, you have to make it universally visible. And so that, you know, caches are great for, 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 for reading data, but unfortunately, we also want to write data. If you update some variable, some value in your cache on your notebook, you need to tell everyone else it's been updated. So these architectures have limited scalability for two reasons. A, this is a single bottleneck to memory. But B, you might say, isn't that fixed by having cache memory? It turns out that it's, when you update the cache, you have to tell anyone about it, cache coherency. And that becomes increasingly difficult to, to, um, um, uh, to um, sustain. Uh, modern machines tend to act. So what happens? Imagine you say that the limit here is four. Okay? I find it hard, say, to put more than four cores here to the memory. Well, what you can do is you can stitch these together. And these are called non-uniform memory access architectures. So what I could do is I could have a computer which appears to have 16 cores in a symmetric, uh, um, in a, in a, it have 16 cores all attached to the same memory. And logically, that's what's happening. You have 16 cores, and you, and you see a single block of memory. However, physically, the memory is distributed. So I might have 4 gigabytes here, 4 gigabytes here, 4 gigabytes here, 4 gigabytes here. Now, each core can, can still access all the memory. Logically... To you as a user, it looks exactly like that. It looks like there are 16 cores, all of which can read and write to a single block of memory. However, the implementation is that the memory is physically disjoint. What you've done is you've bought four quad-core processors and you've stitched them together. That means it's called non-uniform memory access because access to the memory here is fast, but access to this memory here is slow. It's, 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 it's invisible to you. As a programmer, you just read and write memory. But if the memory happens to be stored in the wrong place, you have to go over some link and a couple of extra links. You can see there are, these are, some sort of, there, there are various paths connecting these. And it's that which, um, which makes this um, the, 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 um, um, the limiting factor in these kind of architectures. Well, is, is making it, the access to your own memory is fast, but access to other people's memory can be slow. And so, again... Um, these are often called multi-socket architects. What it means, if you looked at the motherboard, there will be four sockets. You plug in one, two, three, four processors, each of which is a quad-core processor. And so, then, so internally, they can communicate very quickly with each other via this memory. But if they want to communicate with other people's memory, they have to go over these, these, some external link, some, some other uh, protocol for, sharing, for, for transferring data. 
And so cores have a faster access to their own local memory here. That's why it's called non-uniform memory access. And this is, so anything with up to, I don't know, you know, eight or eight cores or something is liable to be like this. Beyond that, when you get up into the 16s and the many, the many tens of cores, the architecture is, is, is probably like this. However, to you as a programmer, it looks like you have a single block of memory with all the cores connected to the memory. It just might turn out that you finally find your program is running slower than you thought because your program is running here and all the data is over here. So that is, can be quite difficult to cope with. So shared memory architects, most computers are now shared memory architects due, due to multi-core. There are some true SMP machines um, where, where, where every core has symmetric access to the, um, uh, to the memory, but most modern architectures are NUMA, non-uniform memory access. You program the NUMA as if you're an SMP. Your model, your conceptual model, is it's a symmetric multiprocessor. The details are hidden from the user. But the important point is that all cores are controlled by a single OS. It doesn't matter if you have this architecture or this architecture. There's a single, oper single copy of the operating system which is responsible for managing all these cores. Um, it's difficult to build shared memories with large core, core numbers. I mean, with, there are tricks, but even with this, with this um, architecture, only very specialist machines can go beyond about 1,000 cores. They're expensive and power-hungry, and you have two problems when you go up to these levels of, of, of thousands of cores. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, this cache coherency problem just becomes harder and harder. Every time someone up, up, uh, updates their data, you'd like to just update data in your local cache, your local copy. But if, you, if, you're, if you're changing data, you have to tell everyone. You have to tell everyone, look, I've just updated this value. If you've got a copy of it, it's now out of date. So you can spend all your time telling people about what you're doing rather than actually doing any useful work. Secondly, it can be difficult to scale the operating system. It can be difficult to actually get the operating system to effectively manage this large number of cores. It can be very, very difficult to do. And so what we've done for many years is distributed memory architectures. So here you could call them a cluster, but the important point here is you buy some interconnect. You buy some, actually I have some here. You, know, you, you have multiple laptops and you connect them with wires. Switch. This is Ethernet cable, which I actually just used to, my, the zip is broken on my, la on my rucksack, so I used it to tie up my rucksack. But anyway, you, you buy some um, interconnect. And so you have multiple computers, and this is why I said th th the analogy of lots of laptops is a useful analogy. You have multiple computers connected together by an interconnect. And when I said processor here, I'm being slightly, slightly flippant, but this, in a real machine, this would be a multi-core processor. But what you do is you buy lots of, of, of you might call them laptops, or you, of course you wouldn't buy a screen and, 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 uh, and disk and um, keyboards with them. You'd buy something fairly bare, like some, some, um, just some, some rack-mounted system. But you have multiple uh, um, systems connected by an interconnect. And what is important about each of these systems, which I've called here a processor, is that each of these is a separate copy of the operating system. I said that's why the laptop analogy is useful. Each of these nodes is running a completely its own copy of the operating system. So within here, if this is a multi-core architecture, they're under the control of a, the same operating system, but different nodes have different operating systems. Well, hopefully the same version, but physically you know, different copies of the operating system. So each self-contained part, is called, as I said, is called a node. Each node runs its own copy of the OS. Um, so almost all HPC machines are distributed memory. The reason is that if you, have a, if, if you have a good enough interconnect, you can basically just, you can go out there and say, you know, what's the most cost-efficient multi-core processor you can buy me? So you, you basically buy, you find the sweet spot in the market and say, at the moment, 16-core machines are the, you know, the, the, that's the sweet spot. It'll be a sweet spot because there'll be a mass market for them. High-performance computing still, I mean, although Archer has hundreds of thousands of cores, that's dwarfed by the number of cores in Edinburgh and people's laptops, okay? So HPC, the machines may be big, but globally it's a relatively small market. So you look at the market and say, what's the sweet spot in the market, the, the most cost-effective node to buy, and then you string lots of them together. And you can do that if you have a good enough network. Um, or we call it the interconnect. Um, I mean, um, basically, um, you, you need to have a reasonable um, interconnect. A lot of applications, as I said, are, are either CPU memory or I/O. And in fact, most 
um, scientific computational, uh, sorry, computational science applications are memory bound. Um, this thing is still also. Um, some of them are, are maybe I.O. bound as well. I'll come back to that. Um, standard interconnects like, you know, Ethernet, the kind of stuff you use in a, in a computing lab, doesn't give you the performance you require. So um, large supercomputers tend to have their own interconnect. So for example, Cray produced something called the Aries interconnect, which is very high performance. The, the last generation of very large IBM machines had their own interconnect. Uh, for mi mid-range systems, InfiniBand is dominant. InfiniBand is, is, is kind of a crossover. If you're a, if you're a sort of a business or a commercial user, InfiniBand would be the kind of high end for you. That's kind of you know, spending money, uh, high end money. Um, for high performance computing, it's more kind of entry level. The problem we have with HPC um, is that actually low, what, high bandwidth is relatively easy to achieve. If I want to get high bandwidth, if I've got two computers connected by a cable and I want to double the bandwidth, I just put two cables in. Okay? Just make the motorway, put more lanes on your motorway. And that's really where the drive is in the commercial market. High bandwidth is what most domestic, what domestic users want. Um, it's actually latency. It's, it's, it's the latency which, which it turns out to be the most important thing typically in, in, in uh, scientific and technical computing. That's the time it takes to transfer a small message. And it turns out that most applications send a large, unfortunately, send a relatively large number of relatively small messages. So it's the latency that matters. For, for commercial use, really, low latency isn't particularly important. I mean, if you're, if you're watching um, an ultra-high-def football match on your TV, you don't care if it's half a second you know, later than it was broadcast. Even if you're playing a, a computer game over a network, if you have delays of order milliseconds, thousands of seconds, thousands of seconds you won't notice them. But we want to have latencies down in the, in the microseconds, not milliseconds. So that's why it's not universal, but to a large extent, you know, the, the, what differentiates a, a supercomputer is the interconnect. That's the, that, that's the piece which has to be specially designed uh, because there isn't so much of a commercial demand for it currently. Um, almost everything now is this distributed shared memory hybrid. Okay, that's, that's the standard... It, standard thing, that each, each node you buy is a multi-core node. So what I've got here is I've got nodes, each running their own operating system, connected by some interconnect, but each node is a multi-core node. That's all completely universal. Um, each node will be a shared memory system, a multi-core processor. The network will have some topology. Earlier networks had quite simple topologies. They had regular grids. Some of the early Cray machines were, were just a 3D, a 3D torus. Literally, the, the, the network was a grid a 3D grid. Um, they're much more sophisticated now. The Cray Aries, um, I don't have a slide here, but the Cray Aries network, um, which is used on, on Archer, is something called a dragonfly topology, but it's very multi-level. Very, very, it has many, many levels, and it, it has multiple paths between any two nodes. It's all very, um, very quite complicated. Um, hybrid architecture, so now in reality, each node will actually be itself be a, a NUMA system. Each node will have multiple um, physical processors in it, which of them is multi-core, stitched together to give the illusion of a shared, large shared memory machine. Um, and they'll, again, each of these will be connected by a network. And so, as I said, um, yeah, the, the nodes on the end of each network are, are already very powerful um, systems, and, and they are shared memory systems with multiple cores. So... They're called multi-socket systems because that's really what these are. If you looked at the motherboard, there would be four sockets where you'd plug in your four processors and they'd be stitched together with some, um, with some, um, some protocol, some wires to let them communicate with each other. But the important point is each node here, doesn't matter if it's a shared memory node or it's this NUMA architecture, it runs a single copy of the OS. So all these cores here, here 16, are under the, under the, the, the um, um, control of a single operating system. So as I said, um, almost all HPC architects fall in this class. Now we'll cover the software, so I'm kind of very much talking about the hardware side here, we'll cover the software side next week. But most applications in scientific and technical computing use the message passing MPI model for programming. So what you do, and we'll cover this in more detail next week, is you run a single process per core, you run multiple processes, 
and they communicate with each other by sending messages and they use a library called MPI, the message passing interface. And you can think of this as parallel programming um, where whenever you want to communicate with somebody, you phone them or send them an email or, or post them a letter. It's a very, so basically you have lots, this is again, the analogy I would use here is two people in different offices, each with their own whiteboard. The important point about, I haven't, um, the reason this is called, this may be obvious, the reason it's called the distributed memory architecture is that the memory of this node here is completely separate from the memory of this node here. This node cannot read or write directly to this node's memory. They're separate computers. Think of, think of them as two laptops joined by a, a, a piece of network cable. Um, so this is a distributed memory architecture. Uh, but the way that this, that, that this works is that whenever you want to talk, to, to communicate with somebody, it's a very explicit process. It's like sending an email or making a phone call. And we'll see that that's done. That's called message passing. And that, that is, is almost universal in, in, in computational, sorry, in um, scientific and technical programming done using a library called MPI. Um, however, obviously, on a particular node, you have a shared memory, whoops, on a particular node, you have a shared memory architecture. So these, the, all these guys here can read and write to the memory directly. So they could, it's like you've got four people in an office, so they've got the same whiteboard. It seems crazy to phone your office mate when you could just read and write to the same whiteboard. And so on a node, you can use um, sh shared memory techniques, which based on threads. Um, we'll come back to this next week, but, but it's based on threads, where threads can share memory with each other. Um, and the technique, the, the, live, the way that's done in uh, high performance computing is typically using a programming model called OpenMP. If you come from a computer science background, you probably think more about programming this using POSIX threads or something like that. But um, there, has, um, there is a, an interface to, to threaded programming called OpenMP. And the reason it's used in scientific and technical computing is it, it's been designed, the API has been designed to make it easy to write the kinds of programs which we write in computational science. Um, it all becomes quite complicated because you have multiple processes that you want to distribute across multiple nodes. With each node, you have multiple threads you want to distribute across multiple cores. It all becomes a bit, um, a, the details become a bit complicated, but, but, but the, the, con the, the actual conceptual level is quite straightforward. So just a couple of examples. Archer, um, each node has 24 cores. So if we thought we had about 5,000 nodes on Archer and over 100,000 cores. But physically, if you, looked up, if you go and look up um, the Intel catalog, they won't, there's no 24 core processor. Well, there wasn't when Archer was built. It's actually two processors, each of which has got 12 cores in it, stuck into the same node. So it's two of these almost 3 gigahertz. That's the kind of magic figure, two, 3 gigahertz. Intel uh, processors. Uh, each node is a 24-core shared memory NUMA machine, each controlled by a single copy of Linux. Um, so we have about 5,000 nodes. So, so, so Archer is running about 5,000 copies of Linux. Um, and as I said, the reason that it, it all works is the network is something is a very high-speed network called to, developed by Cray called the Cray Ares network. And it is very high bandwidth, but more importantly, it's high latency. Uh, sorry, high latency. It's low latency. It's low latency. The other point you have to admit, don't want to go too much detail, but you might have... A, it's important to note that all these cores here, here 16 cores on this node, share the same, they, they, they share the same network interface. And so the network has to be able to cope with lots and lots of messages. You know, you've got you know you've got lots and lots and lots of cores all firing uh, messages down 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 onto the network. So the network has to be coped with a very high message rate. It needs to be able to cope with hundreds of thousands, millions of messages per second, which again is something which a, a more standard network might not be able to cope with. The other machine I've mentioned here is Cirrus. Cirrus is um, a new machine. Uh, well, it's been around at EPCC for a couple of years now, at least over a year. But it's recently been opened up as a national service, um, and it has more modern processes. It's a newer machine. But again, you can see the same, you know, it's 32, 36 cores, um, th 36 cores per node. This, okay, 36 cores per node, which is actually two 18-way multi-core processors. Um, if you're a simple person like me, you'd, you'd wish that they were, you'd wish that a multi-core processor had 16 cores. But, okay, they squeezed a couple of extra ones on, so it's 18. 18 is a horrible number. But anyway, 
Again, a couple of gigahertz, um, a single copy of Linux controlling all 36 cores. And we have 280 nodes. And because this is, this is not a, a national level service, this is a, more of a, a regional level service, it's InfiniBand network. It's a more standard off-the-shelf network. You might ask about accelerators. So there's been a lot of interest recently in using, um, I mean, it's very, very expensive to develop a new processor. It costs billions of dollars to develop a new processor. As I said, um, high performance computing is a very niche market. So we use, we use the processors which appear in laptops and desktops. Luckily, there was one other market which wanted high performance uh, calculation, and that's the games market. And the kind of calculations you want to do to do 3D graphics at H HD resolution and 50 frames a second is lots of floating point calculations. It's very, it's all um, to do with, you know, it's all very floating point intensive. And so the games manufacturers, NVIDIA, and people develop these very, very fast um, processors uh, developed specifically for gaming, for, GP for graphics processing. But people realize maybe just under 10 years ago, that you could use them for numerical computing. So, so in high performance computing, a GPU, a graphics processor, is called an accelerator. You stick it on your, you could call it the go-faster stripe. You stick it on your processor or your, or, or your machine to make it go faster. And so what you do is you have a number of, what you would have is you would have um, each node will be just like a laptop. Your laptop might have a graphics card in it or a couple of graphics cards. You stick graphics processors onto the nodes. And I'll, I'm going to talk more about GPUs in the final, the, the change between the course this year and the one we ran just over a year and a half ago is that I'm going to talk more about GPUs at the end. But um, it can get quite complicated um, to use. But basically, if we look at this architecture here, uh, oops, this architecture here, um, you might have four sockets, which you can plug four processors into, you might make one of them a GPU or two of them a GPU. So each node might have two CPUs and two GPUs or one CPU and three GPUs, depending on your machine. But, but, but they're kind of tacked on as an afterthought uh, currently. Um, so I'll come back to talk about them more in, in the fourth week. But um, NVIDIA is really the dominant um, um, player in the HPC space for GPUs. Intel also came up with their own accelerated architecture. They call it um, the MIC Many Integrated Core Architecture, which you can argue how much it's like an accelerator and how much it isn't. But um, the, 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 the unifying feature, the, the typical feature of these, what you would call an accelerator, it has a very, very large number of very simple cores. So on a GPU, each core is there to do graphics rendering, and you have thousands of them. On an Intel, you might have hundreds of cores rather than thousands. But I'll come back to these in more. This is the current generation. So we actually have some of these on Archer. Um, so the, the most recent um, Archer, uh, sorry, the most recent Intel accelerated architecture is called Knight's Landing. And each node has 64 cores, um, although there's some kind of hyper-threading, multi-threading in there. So you could, you could call it 256 virtual cores or 64 physical cores. Um, this is slightly different because actually um, here it's self-hosting. So you, on Archer, there are some nodes which consist of these nice landing many core processors. The majority of nodes have standard CPUs in them. Whether or not you call these accelerators is kind of a matter of terminology. But um, um, they, they're, they're sort of subtly different. But people do still call these. So Intel is producing these, these special purpose processors. Uh, following this mic many integrated core architecture, and the, the most recent generation is called Knight's Landing, and we have, have those on, on Archer. File systems, um, I think the only thing to say about file systems is really that there used to be a, well, it was a joke, but it was actually a true statement, that parallel computing was a way of turning a compute-bound problem into an I.O.-bound problem. So basically, you went from a, you started, you were able to tackle huge problems with huge data sets because you had large numbers of processors. So you just spend all your time reading right into disk because you still have one, one really slow disk there. So to support large parallel computations, you need large parallel file systems, file systems which are fast. Now, the way you get fast parallel computers, you buy lots of standard processors and stick them together. The way you build a fast file system, again, a, a single disk 
has a limited bandwidth to it, you know, so many gigabytes per second. If you if work it out, that is not enough to serve the data needs of a large supercomputer, which we thought could have hundreds of thousands of gigabytes of memory. So what you do a parallel file system is lots and lots of disks. You buy lots and lots of disks, and you would maybe put different files on different disks, or if you have a very large file, you might stripe it across multiple disks. But you get performance through parallelism. You get fast disk access, not by having a small number of fast disks. You, have, you get fast disk access in an aggregate sense by having a very, very, very large number of standard disks. It then becomes much more a software problem. How do I manage a file system where, where files are distributed across many physical disks, where an individual file may be distributed across many disks? But, but the solution in hardware is quite simple. You buy lots and lots of disks. Um, and I won't go into any particular detail, but the, 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 um, the way... The, the, the file system which is used on Archer and on Cirrus, which is our other machine, is called Luster. Um, and I won't, this is the architecture of Archer, which is why I'll show this. That you, I said already that you had separate login nodes. Uh, PP is sort of pre and post processing nodes. But let's think of these as the login nodes and your compute nodes. So this is a, on Archer, you maybe have 10 or so fairly standard servers that you log into. Um, you don't log into a particular one. There's kind of a round robin to distribute users across them. And you submit jobs to the hundreds of thousands of compute cores through the batch system. Um, but on the login nodes, you have a fairly standard home file system, which is just the, the kind of standard NFS file system you find on, any, on your laptop and any server. But the compute nodes have this very high performance file system, which is many, many disks managed by this, by this lost file system. And the, the important point about this diagram is on Archer, um, the compute nodes can't see the home file system. So when you're on the login nodes, you can see there are two file systems. You will see, you will see slash home, which is a small file system where you store your programs and compile them and stuff like that. And you'll see slash work, which is a very large multi-petabyte fast storage system. But when you run a job on the compute nodes, it can't see your home file system. So there's a kind of a statement very, very close to the start of the, of the exercise sheet, which says, make sure you CD to your work file system. If you don't, you get weird results. You submit a job, it appears to run, and you get an answer back saying, file not found. And you list, and it's there. And you're like, what? But the reason is that when you're listing, you're running the ls command on these nodes. When you're running the job, you're running the job on these nodes, which can't see the home file system. So it's quite un It's very standard to have a separate home and, 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 and a work file system where you have a, just a normal, regular file system for doing bookkeeping tasks, editing. You have a very special high-performance file system for the very large multi-terabyte multi files. Uh, Archer is unusual in that you can't see the home file system. The idea here is to force users to read and write to the high-performance system from the compute nodes. But that does call... Um, that does cause some, um, some issues. Typically, it's not backed up. It's too big to back up. So um, sometimes on other systems, you might call this call scratch space because it's not backed up in some sense. I mean, we wouldn't call it that, but it's not backed up. It's not possible to back up 10 petabytes of data. Um, we have another system for people to manually transfer data to for longer-term storage. Um, so what's the difference? So there's, a, there's a terminology called tiers. So um, Archer is called a tier one system, which means it's a national system. So Archer serves um, a large section of the computational science um, needs of the UK. Um, our machine Cirrus is a regional facility. So there's one national facility currently, Archer. There are about six regional facilities. These are very recently launched, actually, uh, in the last month or so. Um, there's a list here, and these are tier two, called tier two. Tier three would be institutional facilities, the kind of machines that Edinburgh runs to serve its own units, like the, the EDI or ECDF compute clusters, that they would be called institutional facilities. The very highest level, which people call tier zero, are pan-national facilities, which are, I mentioned that EPCC was, a, was, was part of a European project called PRACE, the Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe, and there... Price buys of order. There are four or five tier zero systems across, distributed across Europe, which are you know, not, they, they're obviously they're hosted in a particular country, but they serve the European community. So, so pan national facilities are tier zero. 
Um, national facilities such as Archer are Tier 1, and regional facilities such as Cirrus are Tier 2. So we have one Archer, and the UK has about half a dozen of, of these. And then Tier 3 would be down here. What differentiates them is really, you know, scale and, 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 and cost. And, for example, we saw Archer had a bespoke interconnect with the Cray Aries interconnect. These uh, Cirrus had an off-the-shelf but reasonably high-performance InfiniBand interconnect, whereas a local system such as you might have um, in Edinburgh would probably use um, Ethernet. It's a very standard interconnect. So it's, it's the, the um, actual processors in these will probably be fairly similar, but the larger systems will have more processors and therefore will require a higher-performance interconnect to allow them to, to operate efficiently. So the summary... The vast majority of HPC machines are shared memory nodes linked by an interconnect. As I keep saying, concept, the conceptual model should be, my conceptual model is, if I'm thinking about hardware, it's lots of laptops connected by, well, connected by Wi-Fi if you want, but I think being connected by physical networking is more easy to think about. Or if you want to think more abstract, I think of that this being as lots and lots of people where you have shared offices, four people in an office, each with a shared whiteboard, that corresponds to four cores, because it connected to a single piece of memory, but you have multiple offices, each of those. So multiple offices corresponds to multiple nodes, each running their own operating system. And to communicate with somebody in another office means picking up the phone. And we'll come back to this differentiation between MPI and OpenMP, processes and threads, shared and distributed memory programming um, uh, next week. Accelerator incorporated at the node level, you, that you plug them in. If you, buy some, if you buy some GPUs, you'll plug so many into each node. And um, these systems, you know, span a wide variety of sizes. Tier zero, you'd call as being multi-petaflops and you know, hopefully up in the millions of cores. But nowadays, I mean, the important point is that, again, 10, 20 years ago, parallel programming was something of a niche market. Now, your workstation will have, might have tens of CPU cores and a couple of GPUs in it. And so the kind of techniques we use to, par to, to program these systems are equally applicable to the world's largest supercomputers as they are to your laptop. Obviously, there are different issues, but the software, if you program using the correct software standards, then you will be able to run the same program on your laptop with an accelerator, with four CPU cores and a, and a GPU as you could on one of the world's largest supercomputers. Um, and so we'll cover that a bit next week. All I want to now is briefly go over the... the, so the are there any, aren't any questions... I was going to go over the exercises because it's quite, I think, hopefully, they're, as I said, they're there to sort of um, illustrate two different aspects. So hopefully I've um, loaded them up. So the first one I wanted to talk about was, I just, I have an example which is, um, this is the, um, the example I want you to think about. So at least for this week, you can do it as a thought experiment, or hopefully it might be fun to write some code to do this um, um, on traffic modeling. And I said I'll come back to this as a kind of prototype example of, of how you might parallelize a real calculation. So computer simulation, traffic modeling is quite important. Um, okay. Sorry, I had a bit of a glitch there. You want to predict traffic flow. You want to predict traffic flow for two kind of reasons. One is, an, well, obviously you want to avoid congestion. These were originally movies, but they've not transferred. You want to co avoid congestion. You don't want to get traffic jams like this. But it's a bit like weather forecasting. Short-term traffic modeling is like weather forecasting. You would decide whether to have a barbecue tomorrow based on the tomorrow's weather forecast or this, this afternoon's weather forecast. If you have control over um, traffic lights or... or, or uh, or um, the way that you, if you can open up extra lanes on a motorway, you might open up the hard shoulder as an extra motorway. If you can have uh, short-term traffic predictions, but you're accurate, you can, you can make the right choices. You can say, right, the traffic's going to get really heavy in an hour. I need to open up this extra lane up, you know, to, be, to be for traffic, or I need to change the, the traffic light. Longer term, which is more like climate prediction, is saying, you know, do I need to build a new motorway? You know, what is going to be the, the effect on the traffic around Edinburgh when we build a new fourth road bridge? Okay? That's a kind of longer term thing. What if scenarios? How is that good? So traffic modeling is a big field. It's very useful to be able to do. Um, sorry, Mike. Okay. So I'm going to do a very... 
uh, what we do is we build a computer model. Actually, this is, a re this is from over 20 years ago. Um, um, there was a com parallel computer simulation written to simulate the Newbridge roundabout, uh, which is a roundabout in the outskirts of Edinburgh. I think what they were trying to do was to optimize the, um, the uh, traffic light sequence uh, to, to, to improve traffic flow on the Newbridge roundabout. Um, but I'm going I'm to do a almost the most simple model you can imagine. So I'm going to divide the road into a series of cells. So I'm going to do a 1D cellular automaton. It, it's almost the most trivial thing you can imagine. So my road here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cells. And they're either occupied or unoccupied. So they either have a 1, which means there's a car there, or a 0, which means there isn't a car there. And I have a simple update rule. I'm going to update the rule. I'm going to update the simulation in, in a series of time steps, t, t plus 1, t plus 2. And each time step, a car moves if it can and doesn't if it can't. So basically, you say this car can move, this one can't, and this one can. So at the first iteration, yeah, each step a car's moved forward if the space ahead is empty. So the first iteration, this happens. Then the second iteration, now those two cars can move, this one happens. And then once you get this car gap, car gap, car gap situation, then actually everyone moves off um, happily. It's important to realize that this is an instantaneous update. I'm not saying, can I move that car, can I move that car, can I move that car? I basically say, look, this car can move, this one can't, and this one can, then I move them all. In other words, it's in I'm not updating the cells in any particular order. It's an instantaneous update. Um, um, and the, it turns out when you write the program, the only way to do that, well... The simplest way to do that is to have a new, a new array and an old array. You have a, a road corresponding to the t plus 1 and an old road corresponding to time t. There are various tricks you can do. Actually, if you update from left to right, you get the right answer in this model. But that's, that's, that's for generally for the, these cellular automaton models, you need to have two copies, the current one and the next one, to, to do the, the update correctly. So it looks like a completely trivial, it's hard to imagine a model which, was, which would be simpler. But it does actually produce reasonably realistic behavior. So um, we could do this by moving pawns on the chessboard. So, so, so sorry, I'm getting a few timing issues here. Uh, my model here is that you have a chessboard with pawns on it, and we're moving them. Um, and we'll come back to that analogy. But it does predict a number of interesting features. At traffic lights, you get the right behavior. But you've got traffic lights, and the cars are lined up together. When the traffic lights go green, everyone doesn't move off Together, basically, you move off sequentially. You know, the traffic doesn't move off as a block. It takes a while, and actually, you might never get to the front of the queue. So that's, that, that's a, um, a reasonably realistic behavior. The other thing is it, 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 it predicts the, on, the onset of congestion. So basically, if you look at the density of cars, okay, so here the density of cars is 50%, because half, half, the, um, half the, the, the cells are, are occupied. If you look at the average speed, the average speed is the number of cars that move divided by, by the number of cars. So if every car moves, the average speed is 1. Okay? If no cars move, the average speed is 0. If half the cars move, the average speed is, is, is 0 0.5. You get this graph. Um, so it's fairly obvious to realize that below 50% filling, this is, this is the asymptotic speed. This is, this is explained a bit more in the, in the exercise sheet. This is after you've run the model for a few iterations. If less than half the cells are full, at some point they arrange themselves that there's gaps between them. And so at, at some point you get everyone's, you can arrange them so there's always a gap, and then, then the velocity is one. Everybody moves. Okay? So for, for less than 50% filling, at least eventually you will get all the cars moving at speed uh, one. If they're all full, Obviously, nobody can move. But the onset of congestion, the, the average speed drops surprisingly rapidly. Well, at least I think it's surprisingly rapid. This is just a, but this is the kind of graph you get. Above 50% filling, you, congestion sets in quite, um, quite rapidly. It actually, this model actually produces even more interesting effects. I, don't, I have a video of this, which I, which I might point you at. But um, it, it, it predicts um, rubbernecking. If you, if you have free-flowing traffic and one car near the front. You, you, you must have had, you're driving along the road or on a motorway and suddenly you have to slam on the brakes because the, the, the traffic in front of you is almost stationary for no apparent reason. And then half a mile down the road you see there's been an accident. 
So half a mile ahead of you, people are slowing down, but, half, but downstream cars are slowing down. If you run this model, you can see that's what happens. If, you, if, you, if some of the cars upstream slow down, you get a, a wave propagating, a, a wave of congestion propagating backwards. So eventually you get congestion way, way ahead of where the accident was. Which is quite, that, that's actually quite interesting. Um, but anyway... In reality, you use much more complicated models with different cars and multiple lanes. But you, I've, this is a very simple model, but it is actually a very good analogy of um, the way that um, real scientific and technical calculations are written. It's a good analogy for two reasons. First of all, it has um, a lot of grid points with different values here, ones or zeros. But more importantly, it has this, this feature, which I mentioned um, earlier on, that you have this locality the state of each cell only depends on the state of its neighbours. You'll find that you know, whether a car moves or not, it only depends on whether there's a car behind or ahead of it. So the, the, the up, when you update a particular grid cell, you only need to know information about its neighbouring grid cells in, in a finite domain. And that, that is a good analogy of real, real simulations, more, much more complicated simulations like traffic model, uh, like uh, weather forecasting. So I had a little... This was my, so this lecture came from a from another public understanding of science lecture where rather than saying we were going to measure the performance in floating point operations per second, per second, which is flops, we did car operations per second, which is cops. So I had pictures of policemen and things like this. But I reckon if somebody did this by hand on the chessboard, here we've got Bobby Fischer, who was a slightly eccentric world master from the 70s, a chess grandmaster from the 70s, I reckon you could update this model. If you did it with pawns on a chessboard, did it as a physical model, I think you could update it at about two cops. So we're going to come back to this, but the exercise, we'll t we'll talk, what we'll talk about next week is if we had, if we had multiple Bobby Fishers, could we, could, could we make this faster? What, what are the, how would we parallelize this model? The exercise for this week is actually just to program this up as a piece of serial code. And that's on the sheet, which I'll cover at the end. Um, but as I said, the way that this works is you've got real traffic, and what you've done is you've said, well, we'll represent that through pawns on a chessboard as a cellular automaton. Um, sorry, the, the animation, the, my animations are going a bit funny here. I'll represent that as pawns on a chessboard. And then I will, um, I will have some update rules, which allow me to update the, the thing. I can then model it by hand, and eventually we'll see if we want to model this, say, on, 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 in parallel on a supercomputer. But you have the real world, some, some representation of it, which gives you some update rules, and then you can, up, you can update it by hand. The analogy for something like weather forecasting, if you want to compute simulation of the weather, is it's the same basic steps, all of which are much more complicated, but fundamentally the same. But you have the real weather, which you represent not by pawns on a chessboard, but by some mathematical equations, which might be quite complicated. You'd have numerical solution methods for those, and then you might write a computer program uh, here to do it, and then you might write it in parallel. So the, the, the fundamental steps from going from the, the real situation through to the implementation are the same in this traffic model as, as for something much more complicated like weather simulation. But of course, there you know the details are much simpler in the traffic model, and that's why I think it's a useful example. So the exercise there is a sheet on the web, um, which I'll just if I can find my web browser um, under the. Um, uh, the course material, which was linked in from the main page, exercise sheet for traffic modeling exercises, it's just a little, uh, you can read it. And it, the idea is really just to write, write a serial program. But it's a useful exercise, I think, if, if you want to learn more about it. The other example, which I'll cover very quickly here, is the sharpening example, image sharpening. This is purely there, it's a shrink-wrapped code which I give you, but the reason for um, giving it to you is so you can run a real parallel example on Archer. I'm going to do this very quickly, running a simple parallel program. So, so you can treat this as a black box. You can treat this as a program which you run and you can just use it to check your account is set up correctly. But there is some thought behind this. Um, so it's really there to familiarize yourself with running a real parallel program. Why is it a real parallel program? Well, I, it's, it's, it's a program which does I.O. It reads in an image and writes out an image, a picture. The reason that's useful is it, 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 it um, highlights this issue on Archer of there being separate home and work file systems. So if you don't run this correctly, you won't get the right answer because it can't find the right image. But what we, you can do is you can run this program on different numbers of cores, different numbers of processors, and see if it speeds up and see if it 
And what we'll talk about next week is various models of parallel performance called Amdahl's law. So if you run a program on twice as many processors, does it go twice as fast? Well, of course, you'd like it to go twice as fast, but in practice it won't. Um, this is a very simple model which you can use to, um, to, uh, um, to illustrate that. I actually took the example, and I realize it's Bob here. I, I took this from something that Bob and people did over 20 years ago. I found on the, on the informatics website many years ago, but it was very useful. So the aim to get you running on the machine, to sort out all the practical details, usernames, passwords, all that stuff. Um, this, is, this is really targeted at the face-to-face -face course. Please ask for assistance if you need it. If you need, if you need help, then you can quickly create an account on the Hackpad and type in your question there, or you could send me an email or such like. I think the Hackpad's probably the best thing to do because it's persistent. So if I answer a question for one person, we can answer it for everybody. Um, but it allows you to help each other. So image sharpening. Images can be fuzzy for two main reasons. Um, random noise and blurring. Random noise is just... You know, things are, are just not what they should be. And blurring is because you, you didn't focus correctly. So this is the famous image of supposedly of the Loch Ness Monster, which somebody finally admitted after 60 years was a fake. Um, but here's an image. This must be one of the authors. You have a fuzzy image, and you want to improve it. You've got a fuzzy image that you want to make sharper. So what you do is you detect the edges, and then you enhance the edges, which makes a sharper image. Okay? The problem is that if the, if the image has got noise, you'll get lots of spurious edges because you'll get pixels fluctuating and it'll look like an edge. So what you want to do is you, you want to smooth. So what you want to do is before you detect the edges, you want to smooth the image, then detect the edges in the smoothed image so they're real edges, not spurious ones, and then you enhance the image at the end. And the way it works is, I mean, the technicalities aren't that important, but each pixel is replaced by a weighted average of its neighbours. To smooth out the noise, you average a picture with all its neighbours, hoping that that will just average out the noise. And you use some weighting function so that you, you, you weight the near pixels with a large amount and, and not with the uh, small amount. So that's how we're going to do the smoothing. You average the pixel with all its neighbours. And then to do, the, um, to do the, um, the edge detection, we just take the second derivative of the image. So this is the, in 2D, this is called the... the, the, the grad squared operator, but we're just taking the second derivative of the image. It turns out that you can combine these operations and you, uh, smoothing the pixels and detecting the edges is the same thing as combining each pixel with its neighbours with this funny inverted top hat weight. It's kind of obvious that if you, if you average each pixel with its neighbours with this weight, then you'll kind of smooth them out. It's not at all obvious that if you use this strange function here it will also at the same time take the second derivative. It's just a bit of convolution and such like. But that's not really important. What, in terms of parallelism, you have this model that you loop over. For every pixel in the image, you combine that pixel with the value of, of its, of its neighbours. And I'm going to use a 17 by 17 block, just for the, the heck of it. So the edge is defined as the sum over all your neighbours, where that goes from minus 8 to plus 8. This is the 17 by 17 block around you of the image times some filter function. So it's just a simple convolution operation, but you pick the filter function so that it does these two things. It both smooths and detects edges at the same time. But that's computationally all you're doing. Um, so that's all you're doing, a convolution operation. Um, and then you do some, you have to add back in and rescale and such like. But the important point is, how can you do this in parallel? Well. The important point is each pixel could be processed independently. You're, you're just, you know, you're, you, each pixel, you're creating a, the edges as a function of the image. You're not changing the image. So you can, you can, everybody can, each pixel is independent of the other ones. And my program does something very, very simple. It's, it's pretty stupid and naive, but uh, a master process reads the image. It broadcasts it to all the other processes, and this is done using MPI. But again, you can treat it as a black box if you want. And then each process computes edges for a subset of the pixels. You combine them back into the master process. And the code reports two times. It reports the calculation time for just computing the edges and the overall time. And the reason which they're not the same is that you have this I.O. phase, where you have to read the image in, distribute it. And so the, the, I will come back to this in more detail next week. But the important point is this calculation boils partitions into two sections. One is the I.O. phase, which you don't expect to get faster as you increase the number of processes, because you have to read in from disk, 
and you have to broadcast it all out. All that is just some overhead. However, the time to calculate the edges from the pixels, you expect to scale to go twice as fast if you use twice as many processors because you, you, each, each processor is, is, is um, operating on half the, the, um, the number of pixels, just like we were able to divide up the calculation of the average income of the world. And so just in, in pictures, we read the image from disk, we broadcast, imagine we had four processors, four processors here, so everybody has a complete copy of the entire image, which is very naive, but it's very simple. And I distribute the pixels round robin. So this was the image, and I had four processors. The first pixel will be done by processor one, then processor two, then processor three, then processor four, then we could go back again. So I just I divvy up the pixels cyclically like a, like a pack of cards. Again, that is way, way, way from being the most efficient thing to do, but it's, it's the most simple thing to do. And so that is the exercise, is really to... There's a serial version for reference. There's an MPI version, which I think is the one you should run. run. I'd not expect you to understand the code, but again, just running it and, and looking at the performance is interesting, hopefully. There is a threaded version using OpenMP, but that's just there for, um, for interest. So the reason I give this out is, A, it's a program you can run on Archer or any parallel system, but it, it's, it's prepackaged for Archer which checks that you know how to submit parallel jobs, but also the way that the performance, the time taken, um, um, uh, varies with the number of processes. It's actually very representative of real programs, and later on we'll come back to simple performance models, which may allow you to predict, you know, predict in advance how long the, the calculation is going to take. So I won't go through the notes because that you can look at them later. That's what really all I want. This is just a couple of things explaining how things work. But the sheet goes, th the sheet goes through things in, in really gory detail. I apologize, it may be too much detail for this audience um, because it, it really assumes that you haven't even really used, um, that you haven't really, that you might be a, a GUI Windows user. So that the, the exercise sheet for the Sharpen exercise sort of goes through gory details like how to run Emacs and stuff like that. So you can skip a lot of this if you're, if you're fairly familiar. But the important point is, um, towards the end, I want you to run, running a parallel job in the compute nodes. I mean, you should go through linearly, but the idea is to run the parallel job in the compute nodes and then look at the parallel performance. And there's a table here you can fill in um, to fill in um, the number of cores you use, the overall runtime, the calculation time, the I.O. time, the total CPU time. And I'll have reference results next week, which we can discuss. But the important point is there are simple performance models which can allow you to, to try and get some understanding of why the performance scales as it does. And so it's not just an exercise in running a program, which hopefully is reasonably fun in itself. There, are, there is some data we can get out of it, which is, which is, which is interesting in the, con in the context of parallel programming. So hopefully that should all be available from the website. Um, I hope there aren't any typos, but if there are, please let us know straight away. But I think I've tested everything. Um, and, and it's up there. Okay. So if you need an account on Archer, the email, I know quite a few people have applied, but Claire sent the email out. That's the instructions to get the account. And you'll have it for a month or so while the course is running. Um, outside of that, I'll maybe look at other ways you can get access. But you can run the, if, 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 I mean, I can, if you've got NPR, if you've got standard GNU compilers and stuff, you, you can run all the stuff on your laptop. The performance characteristics won't be as interesting because you won't be able to run on more, well, you won't get, your program won't go faster on more than, say, four processors because you don't have more than four physical cores. But, but you know, you, you should be able to quite simply um, compile and run these codes on your laptop if you have the relevant software installed. Um, MPI and standard compilers. The, the make files should be portable. There should be comments in the make files to say Cray has slightly the Cray has slightly quirky naming conventions for what its compilers are called and such like. But I think there's commented out um, commented out lines in the make file to tell you how to do it on a more standard Linux cluster or your laptop. But the the exercise it covers running on Archer. It's shrink wrapped to run on Archer, but it. With a bit of help, it should be fairly straightforward to run it on, a, on any machine. OK. OK, so I hope you found that. So what I'll do next, I'll, I'll put up some, um, I may put up some, 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 some sample results during the week. But definitely next week, the first thing I'll do at the start of the, 
of the um, lecture is cover some of those things and, and point out the salient features before I start talking about more about the software. So this week was sort of about hardware. Next week will be much more about concepts of programming. How, how, what, what software, pro what programming models are there that we use to program distributed and shared memory systems? Okay. Okay. Thanks.